Welcome to Spotify Live. Let us do the Patreon question. Sandeep says, I was following the Fair Break tournament and it seems there's plenty of talent amongst the associate team. Dutch, Japanese, Thai, Malaysian women put in good performances. Is it time for the ICC to have more teams in the World Cup uh, than the current 10? I think they had eight in the last World Cup, didn't they, Sandeep? Am I right? I'm trying to think. Was it eight? I don't think it was 10. Um, yeah, I think... Uh, it, <laughs> I, th I think what happened in women's group for a very long time is the talent pool outside the main um, nations, and it was really Australia, South, uh, sorry, Australia, England, and New Zealand was really, really poor for a long time. And then, of course, you had South Africa and India um, come through in the West Indies at the same time. So then you had six teams. And, and it's quite clear now, looking at Bangladesh, Thailand, uh, Pakistan, that women's cricket is starting to, you know, develop in many different places. And obviously we're seeing what's happening, uh, you know, in places like Brazil um, and, and Sri Lanka are going through a, a funk, but, you know, any competent management, which might be a stretch for Sri Lankan cricket, <laughs> would be able to get them back. So I certainly think we're much closer to a 10-team World Cup now than uh, before. Um, I think what you saw in that fair break tournament, though, was like the best of the best. Don't forget. They still have to put out the 11th best player on, on some of those teams. Um, but absolutely, uh, you know, it's very similar to associate cricket a couple of years ago where you suddenly realize that the, the depth and the best players from around the world are really, really strong. And the more they get to play in things like fair break and hopefully occasionally turn up in the 100 and all these other things, you would assume that the quality of that would, would certainly uh, grow. Latchmo says, what is your favorite book by a player? Um, I mean, I suppose that's hard to say because not all books by players are written by players. <laughs> um, I really liked Ed Cowan's book and Akash Chopra's book. They're very, I mean, now they're out of date, but they were very modern when they came out. Um, uh, they, I, I think they talked about a few interesting issues, uh, within the game. Uh, obviously they were, I think in Ed Cowan's case, Gideon Haig might've helped him. And I think in, um, Akash's case, I think Arya Yuyutsu, um, might have helped out with that book as well. Um, but they were still, I think, very much from the player, which a lot of books aren't. And um, I suppose those are the two obvious ones. Uh, you know, there's the, the old Roebuck and Simon Hughes books, uh, which are really interesting. I'm trying to think if there's anything else by players specifically. I find I, there was a point where a lot of cricket magazines were getting me to review their books. And I think they stopped me reviewing books because of how harsh I was. Um, I remember the Ricky Ponting one uh, when he retired. The first 100 pages that I think Peter Lawler had written, I thought were really good and really interesting. And then it was like 400 pages of like, diary entries. It was terrible. Um, and, and so I think the bigger problem is the industry of cricket books, I think, is it's basically written. <laughs> this is the interesting thing. Cricket, cricket books are written for two different reasons. And, and especially ones written by former players, they're basically written to get headlines in newspapers so you can sell more cricket books and they're written, um, to make certain dates. So father's day, Christmas, those sorts of things. And I think if, and, and the problem with that is that very little work is put into the actual cricket book itself. And quite often when the newspaper writers write it, it's not that newspaper writers are bad writers, but they're literally writing it. So there are seven or eight, nine different headliney bits rather than trying to get to the book. Also, through no fault of their own, they're usually not given that long and they're not always given that much access to the players either. Um, so, yeah, more often than not, books from players disappoint me or anger me. Um, but they're certainly, you know, I, I think I think that's probably why the, you know, the Roebuck, Simon Hughes, um, Ed Cowan, Akash Chopra's books stand out a little bit more because they are so honest and and unfiltered it really is a player speaking to you um whereas you know some of some of the other books written around the world and look i've been asked to write it's funny enough i was talking about this with, a, with another writer yesterday and he was basically saying that he he would probably never write another book with a cricketer unless uh well unless that there was a very good relationship between him and him and the, um uh, the cricketer that that only he thought he could, you know, get out. Um, I've never written a book with a cricketer, partly because very rarely, they quite often they're trying to square off personal grudges that they had during their career with the media, with teammates, with opposition members. 
but they very rarely open up and, and be honest. And I've talked to a couple of cricketers who I might write books with in the future about specific parts of their career or <clears throat> specific themes, but it's never quite happened. Um, so generally, <clears throat> sorry, everyone, but generally I'm, I'm usually quite disappointed by cricket books. Uh, Ian Price says it's too early to say Ben Compton has cracked it on the basis of brilliant half dozen county camp championship games. Um, yeah, I think, I, yeah, I, I, I can see why England might even m rush him into the test team, but we don't know that much about Ben Compton yet. For instance, if you are a good player and you haven't been seen that much at the top level, and it's clear he is a good player, um, and he hasn't been seen that much in first class cricket at the moment, his weaknesses are not particularly well known. It's really probably how the rest of the season goes and then how the start of next season goes. And it's, we see that with test cricket as well. You know, you see someone like Matt Renshaw um, come in and make runs and then teams sort of work him out. Um, perhaps you could even say the same as someone like Zach Crawley. I think Zach Crawley making that 100 probably m was one of the things that actually allowed us to see a lot more of Zach Crawley bat. Um, and in those sorts of situations, that's kind of when you start to learn. Ben Compton's different because he's a bit older, so he should know his game a little bit more than those two, and maybe be slightly more rounded. But at the same point, we, you know, we have to just see a little bit more of it. This is a guy not in professional, well, on the on the fringes of professional cricket up till very recently. So I don't think that we should. Uh, I don't think that we should be in a position now where we are. What's the best way of putting it? Um, if England just want to capitalize on good form, you throw them straight into the England team. But if you're really doing proper development and you, and you think he can be a really good player, I think the best thing is for England to learn as much about him as possible. And also probably for Ben Compton to learn as much as possible because he, you know, he should be going up into situations that he's not used to um, very soon. But the whole thing is really interesting. It's great to see. And I love it when an older player sort of works it out. Um, AB says, Major League Cricket just raised 120 million. Uh, in an investor round, how would you spend that money across the infrastructure development, player recruitment, academies coaching, and developing gra uh, grassroots engagement? So I before they announced that, I happened to be on a call with them, and they were sort of taking me through what they were going to do with the money. Uh, obviously, a big part of it is going towards what, what I would call recruitment, but it's not just player recruitment, because when they're recruiting players, they're obviously recruiting, uh, what would you say? Uh, organizational knowledge, if you, if you know what I mean, institutional knowledge. Um, so they're doing that and they're also getting coaches. So that's sort of a threefold thing. The other thing that I thought was really interesting is how much money they are putting into minor league cricket, uh, which is um, not how franchises tournaments usually started. They usually don't worry about anything else other than the actual franchise. So to be thinking about that, I, I always thought that, the, that one of the big bashes um, real advantages was the baby bash back in the day. Um, and you see it with the SMAT um, in, in India and, and perhaps now with the blast um, in the UK, it allows you to continually develop players without them all being at the top level. Um, but that's all, the baby bash is probably the only one there that was on purpose. The other two are just uh, part of the system. USA thinking about that is really important. Also think about this. If you have, I can't remember how many minor league teams is it? Is it 20 or 30 teams? When you talk about the grassroots stuff, you're already looking at that. You're already looking at how far the game is, is moving because you now have professional cricket teams in all these different locations that you did not have before. The academies, I, I get a feeling that a lot of the academies are being funded by cricket fans directly at the moment. And I don't know how many are actually funded directly by Major League Cricket, but they're clearly getting involved with that as well. Um. So, I mean, they probably know their market better than me, but I like the idea of minor league cricket, making sure that there's cricket being played. Um, academies popping up everywhere that are, I assume, at least partially subsidized. Uh, the players that they've recruited being used as coaches and, and mentors is, is really important. I think the only other thing I would do, which I think they already have done, is try and get some key people. I, you know, uh, is there a way that they could subsidize the ringer to have a cricket writer? Um, there's obviously John Boy on YouTube. You know, but have they reached out to John Boyce or Foolish Baseball or, um, you know, some of the basketball guys, that, you know, uh, that might uh, that might like cricket as well? Um, you know, getting Wright Thompson involved, you know, these sorts of things. Um, and then from a gr grassroots perspective, it's just getting as many kids as possible, you know, as many plastic sets as you can, as many teachers involved uh, in, in 
pushing the, the game out there. I, but I do think they're doing quite a few things right. I still, I still think they're going to have a huge problem when it comes to uh, the administration and everything else of American cricket, because that's always been a huge problem in the US. Um, but it does seem like from the outside anyway, they're doing a lot of things right. HW341 says, uh, can you shed any light on what SF Barnings bowling action was like? I've heard it described as basically medium pace leg breaks. Is that correct? Or well, why do you think no one has tried to mimic his style in the last hundred years? Yeah. So he, Barnes called himself a spinner. Um, and at the time, everyone called him a pace bowler. He had a short ball and he had a Yorker. Um, so he certainly wasn't a traditional spinner. And, and you got to remember in those days, we had a bit more, spinners were a bit more hybrid. Um, I think it's, is it Legler who opened the bowling for South Africa? Um, there are still places where he's discussed as a, opening bowler and other places where he's discussed as a, as a leg spinner. Um, chances are he probably bowled a little bit of both. Um, and I think that Barnes was very similar to that. If you go back and you have a look at my video, HW341 on uh, Mustafiza Rahman, you'll see that I talk about Barnes. I think Barnes probably bowled leg spin and off spin um, at, at very decent pace. And I think that as revolutionary as that sounds, that was probably far more common. Um, at that point, because seam bowling was only just developing, uh, you know, you had Spoffer, then you had Tom Richardson sort of, you know, really working out, uh, Barton King, these guys are really working out how the seam could help them as bowlers. Remember, they didn't really have to do that beforehand because the pitches were so bad, uh, that the seam, swinging the ball in the air and, and seaming the ball didn't matter. But as the pitches start to get good in the late 1890s, um, then you, you have to actually start to think about the kind of deliveries that you're bowling and what you're doing. And that, you know, Spoff was probably a little bit ahead of the game there. Richardson probably uh, worked out seam bowling a little bit earlier than other people. Barton King uh, probably bringing the baseball. In, in fact, um, Spoffer and Barton King both brought baseball philosophies to cricket. Um, and then from that point, it's probably that combination of the seam um, and working out how to move the ball, you know, both ways in the air consistently and on purpose. Um, that sort of takes over. So there's there's a lot of guys, there were swing bowlers who were probably putting revolutions on the ball to be, be swing bowlers. And I think that's probably something, that's probably how Sid Barnes started, was probably putting revolutions on the ball. But yeah, you know, uh, if you, Mr. Fazar Rahman, uh, Pat Brown are two modern versions of it. They bowl off spin at top pace. A part of, I would say the difference there is that you can keep more pace on the ball uh, with that. Whereas that didn't matter as much in Sid Barnes' era um, because the, the wickets weren't as hard and weren't as flat. Um, so taking a little bit of pace off the ball was not uh, the end, end of the world. But I also assume that he did bowl that. And then, of course, the other uh, big bowler who did that was Bob Appleyard, who is an incredible bowler um, worth looking into. Had probably one of the best three or four year peaks of any bowler that we've ever seen, but also completely tore his body apart trying to bowl spin at, you know, uh, as, at, a, at a medium fast level. Um, and also had other problems with his body separate to that. Um, but, but yeah, I think that's probably the best way of looking at it. Uh, Christopher says, after the first round of blast fixtures, a lot of interesting stuff has happened, but it barely made any waves in sports news. Does cricket in England really struggle to sell the narrative from top to bottom? Are the ECB and counties not doing enough? There's a lot of talk about predicting, uh, protecting county cricket, but we can't just live in this vortex of treating it like fun, or a serious sport happening. Yeah, um, well, Christopher, I, I think you you've really mentioned to me on Twitter that I kind of answered this in my latest video and podcast where I talk about the coverage of cricket. Here's the, here's something that I haven't really talked about yet. So I went to the ECB with a business plan, uh, where I said that I could, so, so currently the ECB are paying county reporters and paying hundreds of reporters to cover the game. And I, I look, it's a failure, that system. And I'll tell you why it's a failure. They don't have enough people. They're not, covering the game in the right way. Um, they're writing about it in a very old fashioned way and newspapers don't really want the content. And also they have no other way of, so a lot of times if that content isn't being used by a newspaper, it's not really going to the fans directly. What I suggested was a huge upheaval of all of that. And it was a business plan. So they would have had to, they would have basically been giving me, uh, some money towards it but I would have then been going out and getting advertising and subscribers and, and, and building it up. It's essentially, it's the plan that has become 99.94. And what I wanted to do is have 18 writers in County Cricket uh, and all of those people to be able to do video and podcasts as well. 
um, and to really have analysis there so that at the end of each day's play, you would be emailed uh, 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 something on something like Substack uh, with analysis in it. At the end of each day's play, you would have a podcast available to listen to um, and you would have a video on YouTube to be able to follow. They haven't done that and they're still, and, and you have this situation where th this sort of ever dwindling support from the ECB for this reporters network, which is, it's, it's not a tenable way to go forward that you're paying the reporters to do it. And realistically, there are enough fans out there. But the problem is that the way that county cricket's always been covered is sort of local newspapers chipped in and then a few people sort of covered it on whole. And so the major organizations, so Crick Info, uh, The Cricketer, all kind of try and cover everything in one go um, rather than having writers individually, which is why this business plan I had was a huge step forward in this. Sadly, the ECB had already spent so much money on the 100. I just don't think they had the money to be able to do it. But it's obviously uh, a huge problem, um, I think. And this isn't a problem for counter cricket, Christopher. This is a problem right across the game. You know, there are so many things. You know, I've said this a million times, but there's no full-time professional cricket riders in the West Indies or New Zealand. Um, and that is a huge problem for cricket. And it's not the only thing. There are not enough full-time professional women's cricket riders. There are not, you know, right, you know, T20 riders right across uh, the way that the game is covered. Um, but yeah, you know, I thought that I gave the ECB a way out uh, where I needed a short-term investment that would have saved them a lot of money in the long term um, and would have given them far better coverage uh, and also would have grown a whole generation of cricket writers and cricket multimedia talent. Uh, and uh, they went the other way, sadly, with that. So um, I'm still happy to have chats with them um, going ahead. I know that the plan still works. Obviously, with 99.04, where, uh, you know, it might be something that I, we, we still do. In fact, I still want it. I, I essentially want someone to cover every major cricket team in the world, um, yeah, I'm, you know, from Otago through to India, if you will. Um, sorry to all the Otagan fans out there. Otagans? They called Otagans? I don't know. Johnny says, should McCullum recall Ali Butler Rashid or do England need to move on? I think Moen Ali is a must. Rashid, I suppose, just depends if they think he's going to be a better test bowler in the next three years than Matt Parkinson. Uh, Butler, I don't see what McCullum's going to be able to do with Butler that everyone else couldn't do with Butler. Like, I mean, Ed Smith's the biggest Butler fan ever and pumped up his tyres and Trevor Bayless told him to go out there and whack him. And we still got mediocre results. Um, I just think the team is a lot stronger with Besto as a wiki keeper than it is with Butler in the team and Besto as a batter. Um, that said, I think when you look at Butler's numbers, he has, what, the third best batting average over the last couple of years? Maybe they do stick with him just because he's got one of the better batting averages. Although the problem is that he has to bat at six or seven. And, that, and that, that's always been his problem. He's a, he, he's, I think he's produced good results for them, but in a limited way. Um, so I, I'm not sure I can answer that perfectly for you, Johnny, but Mo and Ellie is the one I think they couldn't replace um, and definitely needs to come back. Um, the other two, probably more situational, perhaps. Will says, what do you make of Lord struggling to sell tickets? I know people are paying ticket prices, but they've always been high. That's true. Sure, the issue is more poor performance in the England team recently and the fact that New Zealand toured last year, even playing at Lords. Yeah, to be honest, I, I've kind of dipped out of this one. I mean, ticket prices have always been high, as you say. Um, you know, people have just noticed, it, it, it does feel like people have just noticed that in the media, that ticket prices are really high and that might cause problems for people. Um, and, and I shouldn't say the journal, it's not the journalist, but it's the groundswell where everyone's noticed it at the same time. Um, we, you know, talk about it a lot in the press. So, um, suddenly the, it's become the, the topic of the summer so far, even more so than McCullum, which is quite interesting. Um, <clears throat> I don't know if that's specifically if, if the ticket price is being too high for this particular test. Uh, look, it's up to Lords, I suppose. They they set the fees as far as I'm aware for individual grounds. But I do think that over the last couple of years, there's absolutely no doubt that ticket prices to test matches in England and the England fans, when they travel overseas, get the same thing. I think they get gouged at home and away uh, for loving a form of the game because so many other countries don't. Um, uh, the fan bases don't turn up and don't have that kind of money. And I just feel that England fans are being used to subsidize something that realistically you want, what you want is more fans in the ground. Um, and I don't think charging uh, fans huge amounts of money uh, 
outside of perhaps for the Ashes or maybe the Indian series makes that much sense. Um, but yeah, I don't know what it is right at the moment. Uh, you also asked if uh, what I would do if I controlled the English season. Oof, well, I change everything probably. But uh, what what do you make of George I Dobell's idea of doing mini IT T Twenty tournaments over a day or a weekend? No, I, I don't. Uh, I mean, I haven't seen the full plan, so I'd have to have a look at George's full plan. Um, but T20 cricket works best as a league. Um, uh, it allows for uh, constant content. Um, it it allows for, I mean, what you really want is a T20 tournament that, that has a game at prime time every day of the week. Um, that's the ideal T20. Um, th that's why T20 is worth so much money at this point, realistically. The crowds that came in, especially in early um, blast cricket, was important but realistically it's that ability to put a game on every night of the week uh it, which which essentially makes t20 cricket work uh and it's sorry it gives it something that international cricket can't do so make your into mini um t20 i tournaments oh that well that's over uh, that's internationals is it is george's plan um uh, i don't know i'm not when it comes sorry if it comes to international cricket I don't know how much international T20 eyes we even need to play realistically. Uh, I think they should be played more like friendlies and around big tournaments when you're trying to, you know, come into a tournament. I think the way that one day cricket and ODI cricket is currently played um, probably doesn't make sense going forward, being that the World Cup's the major events and the domestic tournaments, are, especially in T20 cricket, are so much more important. Um if you did a mini T20 tournament over a day or a weekend and one of your international players got injured because they're over bowling, you know, uh, it could be a problem as well. I don't know, uh, but I haven't seen George's plan. So it's a tough one for me. Uh, Surf says we're moving towards full quality across the men's and women's game. Oh, assuming we're moving. Yeah, I was going to say. Um, the standard defined parameters for the boundary as well as the weight of ball. How likely is that to impact each group and to what extent? Uh, well, the ball, the ball is already different and the boundary size is already different. Uh, why would you need the women's ball to get heavier? I don't understand why you would have to do that. Um, the, I, I mean, there are lots of um, subtle changes between the men's and the women's game that we already have that I don't think people even know about. Um, I don't see what making if, if you make the men's uh, the women's ball heavier, it means it's going to be bigger, uh, which is probably going to really affect spinners. I don't really see the point of that, um, and I don't understand why would you make the men's ball lighter. So I don't really understand uh, why you would need to do that. I think that bringing the boundary ropes in for the women's games makes sense. Although to be honest, as time goes by, they might end up with that. But I think hand size probably isn't going to change as much. So. Um, uh, I've got no problem with that, but you know, if the women suddenly decide they want the boundaries out at the same size as men's, um, and the ball at the same size as men's, you know, I back that as well, but I can't, I don't really see how that changes anything. Um, realistically, I, I don't think that many fans know, for instance, that the women use a different ball. Um, so I'm not sure that that matters. Uh, James says much has been written about the difficulty of bowling illegal Dusra. Well, me really has an unusual combination of limited elbow extension and very mobile shoulders. I'm not seeing any, uh, anything similar said about Suck Lane, who bowled his deuce row without incident. Uh, why and so few others bowl it if Suck Lane could? Um, I don't think Suck Lane was tested as much. Um, I think if Suck Lane was still bowling around 2014 when they started testing everyone, we probably know a lot more about how legal his uh, particular delivery was. I think it is possible to buy, bowl a Dusra legally, whether it is possible to bowl it at pace legal, legally, <laughs> at the same pace that you can bowl off spin is probably the more interesting part of that. Um, uh, I think uh, uh, when Suck Lane came through, I'm trying to remember if he was tested. Oh, he must have been, wasn't he? Um, but I can't remember him being tested. Um, uh, I think... My memory is, and I have to go back and have a look, that Suck Lane might have been slightly more front on. You can't compare Murley to anyone else anyway, because he, forget the elbow and the mobile shoulders. He actually wasn't bowling off spin in, in a, with a normal action. So his deuce rate is not even with a normal action. So it's not comparable to anyone else. 
the information that I've always seen is that it is very possible to bowl a deuce rut legally. It's just not possible to bowl it legally at the same pace. Um, but I, I can't really help you with the suck lane uh, thing because I can't remember if he was tested or not, which would help help me out a lot more um, because then then we would have some data on, on whether he was actually able to do it in the same way or not. Um, my guess is that in a way, I, I don't know how many people know this, but a wrong end is slower than a leg spinner. And in some ways, I think it's a similar problem to the Dusra. The difference is that a wrong end is only marginally slower than a leg spinner. And there are also ways that you can slightly quicken up your wrong end um, to make them similar. Whereas I think when you try and quicken up your Dusra, that's when your action starts to fall apart. I think I'm saying that correctly. I hope I've answered some of that for you, uh, James. Aditya says, based on recent selections, it seems that the Indian selectors have zeroed in on KL Rahul and Rishabh Pant as successors to Rohit Sharma. Yeah, I think that seems fairly fair. Um, uh, what are your views on their capacity styles and whether they could su succeed international level? Um, I'm not sure either are brilliant tacticians. Uh, Rishabh Pant, I mean, when he started captaining, I, I still got the, the mindset um, of like when he was first captaining, he couldn't even count overs correctly. Um, you see some of those, first, those early games he did for Delhi was it last season, wasn't it? Uh, I didn't, I didn't see a brilliant tactician in his captaincy. K.R. Rahul is sort of, you know, a little bit more of a, uh, keep the trains running on time. I mean, that makes him sound like a dictator, doesn't it? <laughs> but I didn't mean it that way, but you know, a little bit more of, uh, I think players like him, things happen that are correct roughly around him. Obviously, you might have to throw Hardik Pandya into that mix now because of what's his captaincy certainly looked quite good. Um, but yes, I think I think you what you're talking about here is um, India are picking those two guys. I ha I don't think either of them are absolutely brilliant captains, but I think India as a team has a very good structure around them. And if they maybe modernise their white ball cricket a little bit, there's no reason why they can't be dominant in all three formats again uh, very very soon. Um, so if that's the case. Not sure it matters that much that who the captain is. Um, you're talking about very fine margins when you're talking about captaincy. And your other question was, uh, along with New Zealand, they're the only major side with one captain for all three formats. Uh, is that sustainable, desirable? I don't think it's sustainable. Um, it certainly wouldn't be desirable for me. I think you probably need different leaders focusing on different things also you know um in kale Rahul's case they might is he might not be a test match player i think he is but i know what he, he averages mid 30s at the moment in test match cricket if he comes back in and he gets a series where he's up against pat cummins or rabada on a bunch of friendly tracks and that average goes down to 32 you're just putting a lot of pressure on him for no reason um i really think that they should be separated more and more. Uh, Kane Williamson is slightly different because I think in his particular case, uh, that suits the way that they want to play white ball cricket. And so he's an automatic selection in, in all three of those teams. And if once he's in the team, probably want him to be captain because he's Kane Williamson, there aren't going to be as many cases like that going forward in cricket, I don't believe. Satchmo says, uh, Richie Benno is a trained newspaper journalist. Do you think TV commentary to, commentaries will be improved by sending news, new commentators on compulsory journalism courses? No, because I don't think journalism courses are particularly good. Um, uh, you know, although you can uh, go and do my uh, course, uh, which is what I basically came up with because I don't think uh, those courses are particularly good. Um, so, n no, but I do think that you're going to be a much better commentator if you are a uh, if you've done some journalism and reporting. Um, I think you look at things different. I think you do a lot more work. Um, there are some commentators. I, I I'll talk about a couple of commentators. So obviously, there's a few in England, um, especially Athers and Goffey. Goffey's not a traditional journalist, but because he had his own radio show, you know, to be able to broadcast for whatever it was, two or three hours in prime time on one of the biggest stations in the UK, he had to do a lot of research going into each episode. I think that really helps his commentary. And Athers has been a proper writer at times and a proper journalist at times. Um, sometimes it's just Michael Atherton says pieces, but he does a lot of journalism on the side and has certainly tried to improve his journalism a lot over the years, I would say. You know, he's written about other sports and all those sorts of things. Um, so I think from that perspective, uh, that uh, having seen that 
close up with both of them, I think that definitely helps. Going from the game where you've only ever done probably press conferences where you're not really talking about cricket most of the time, you're talking about someone's form or, or whatever else, to commentating the game is a huge jump. And I think too many players do it without any background on how much work they should be doing. They're not trained correctly by producers and by TV companies and, you know, occasionally by radio networks. Um, and I think that too often they just say things to fill dead space. I'm not saying being a journalist particularly makes you a better commentator. What I am saying is that I think being a journalist allows you to do a lot more work, which means when you're saying something, it's probably more of a basis of fact. Um, and you're continually looking up things, not just going back to your playing days. Nadika says, in soccer, people talk about goalkeepers being in good form or out of form. I don't hear people talk about that with wicket keepers. Uh, no, it doesn't get mentioned as much. I mean, we don't talk about wicket keepers much, but is it because we don't have a way of measuring this, like how soccer has XG and X saves? Yeah, I, I think there's, I've never quite managed to write this piece, but I don't think people, I think when, when you get a young wicket keeper who comes in, who's like known as a specialist keeper or is known as the best glove man in his country. And he, and, he, and he makes a mistake. You see all the people, a lot of people get, get up and, ah, this is why we pick someone who can bat, blah, blah, blah. Forgetting the fact that if you pick the best young batter in the country and you put them into the team at 22 or 23, they're going to fail a bunch. There's this whole idea that wicket keepers kind of come whole and they're always the same. And of course, wicket keepers have, have four. Um, of course, they go up and down, you know, they see the ball better, their feet move better that, you know, with wicket keepers, wicket keepers and fast bowlers are perpetually bowling, uh, perpetually playing with a form of injury, right? Um, it, whether it be back, out, back, knees, uh, fingers, uh, wrist, whatever it may be for a wicket keeper. Um, and if that's the case, then your form should wildly vary uh, between these things. And I don't think that is always factored into uh, the way that we think about wiki keeping. And I think it's a big mistake, but part of it is at the moment anyway, because we don't have uh, ways of measuring it. But I think we've always looked at it as like, oh, that's the best keeper and he's just going to take all these catches. And if we got the second best keeper and he wouldn't take as many, forgetting that if you pick the best batter and the second best batter in one series, the second best batter might actually score twice as many runs as the best batter. It's over a long period of time that these things start to come out. And I, I think if we could keep it for whatever reason, we don't, do that as much also and this probably does go back to you know uh hockey and ice hockey and, and football goalkeepers as well um we're, we're we're remembering the very bad mistakes a very very good wicket keeper can make very bad mistakes and still be on average a far better wicket keeper than another wicket keeper who makes a lot of smaller mistakes um but that's not how we remember it because that's you know, that's not how our brains are designed to work. Uh, thank you to everyone for those Patreon questions today. Let's see what we have in the room. Atish, you there? Yeah, hi, hi, Dad. Can you hear me? I can. What's your question? Uh, yeah. Uh, over the last week, I discovered this fascinating series on Cricket Monthly called uh, Hate to Love, where writers write about, like, cricketers that they love, but they wish they didn't. Uh, so I was wondering about it and like, I thought about a couple of players that I hate to love. And I was just wondering if you have any such players that you love, but they also like frustrate you a lot or for other like political reasons or controversial reasons you, we shouldn't like, for example, for me, it's Sanju Samson, uh, it's because it's frustrating. There's nothing political about it. I was going to say, when you, you you led into that, I was like, what do I not know about Sanju Samson's politics? Uh, I know. It's from Kerala. So in the rest of India, a lot of people think uh, just the fact that he's from Kerala makes him, like, bad. Uh, there's a lot of biases <laughs> around people from Kerala. But anyway, uh, what's yours? Uh, I've actually written one of those pieces. Uh, my piece was oh, about W.G. Grace. Yeah, I wrote about W.G. Grace um uh, as uh, because i think that w g grace is such a weird figure i remember someone from the mcc was upset that i can't remember what I, what it was but i'd done something i can't remember if it was around rachel hayhoe flint or something where 
they they were like, well, you've mentioned Rachel Hayho Flint here, but you haven't mentioned that um, um, <laughs> that she was. I don't want to say pro apartheid because that's probably too strong a stance. Um, but Rachel Hayho Flint believed cr cr cricket should be played in South Africa during apartheid. She, um, she tried to get the second Women's World Cup into South Africa, and in the first Women's World Cup, they actually had. Um, a tournament. Uh, they actually had a team that was essentially South Africa, but it was called the International Eleven. Uh, and they were very upset with that me. And I said, "Well, you work for the MCC. How often do you mention that W. G. Gray said women shouldn't play cricket?" And he's such a frustrating figure for cricket. I don't think people understand how much better he was. I, I think I, I'm, I'm trying to remember the stats, but there was a particular year in which W. G. Grace made eleven first class hundreds, and the rest of cricket in England made eight. He was that much better than the game, better than Bradman was. Uh, and he also is the reason that the game is how it is. He was the first person to work out. So before WG Grace, players would play on their front foot or they would play on their back foot. So when we talk about front foot and back foot players, they literally had front foot and back foot players. WG Grace was the first one to basically work out, well, wait a minute, if the ball's pitched here, I come forward. And if the ball's pitched here, I go back. He essentially invented modern batting. On top of that, he was an you know, he was a global megastar before we had global megastars of sport. You know, I, I can't remember how many countries he went to, but he traveled around. But he was also a grifter. Uh, he was untrustworthy. He was obvious. I mean, he made KP look like, you know, uh, the <laughs> he made KP look like the least egotistical man you'll ever meet. Um, he played as an amateur, but absolutely made more money than any of the professionals, yet still talked down um, about them. Uh, he was... If he wasn't involved in match fixing directly, there are certainly serious allegations of certain things that he did that are baffling. There's obviously the fact that, you know, he was, he tried to intimidate, well, he tried to intimidate entire teams, umpires, everyone. Um, he was this ridiculous figure, but also cricket needed someone like that at that time to explode the game from what was essentially a game that was a, it was almost a street game with a bunch of posh people playing it. It needed to explode into the big sport that we have today. And WG Grace played a big part in that. So uh, that's why I picked him. I mean, I still like watching Mohamed Azharuddin bat. <laughs> um, obviously not an ideal uh, role model in any particular way. I mean, Mohamed Asif is probably, I suppose, maybe even more that, I mean, yeah, yeah. Check how often, I mean, I, I was WhatsApping Muhammad Asif recently. Um, you know, check how often I've talked about Muhammad Asif. Uh, I don't, uh, he's had, Muhammad Asif might have had one of the biggest impacts in, in world cricket that we will ever see and has nothing to do with his match fixing or his drug charges or anything else that he did. Um, it was simply the fact that Muhammad Asif um, invented the wobble ball, which is, looks like it's going to completely change cricket forever at this point. Uh, in 10 years time, I might look back and go, ah, it changed it for a little while. But at the moment, it looks like it's having a huge impact. Um, but you can't overcome the fact that Muhammad Asif did all the things that he did. Um, so there's two match fixes that, you know, straight away, uh, you know, you look at them differently. Um, I'm trying to think if there's anyone else, but th those are the two that come to mind straight away. I, I don't know if it's a love to hate thing. I, I didn't really like writing that column. Um, I, I don't think it, it's a, it's a really weird thing to say to a professional sports writer that you should write about a play that you love to hate. Um, which is probably why I picked WG Grace rather than a more modern player. But on a very basic level, there are players that you probably don't like as much for, you know, any normal biases that any other human being has. And, um, and it becomes a little bit tricky, but I can't think of that many others that, that I love to hate. Um, I suppose when I was younger, you know, Arjuna Rangatunga, you know, as a captain and a player, the way he played, I really, really admired, but you know, mostly he screwed over Australia. Um, uh, and, uh, <laughs> you know, if you're a young Australian fan, you're like, you know, don't do that. Um, but, uh, but yeah, certainly I think as a player, he would have been a huge hero of mine, I think, um, uh, in a way that Martin Crowe probably was. Um, uh, but because it felt like he hated Australia so much, it was he was a hard player to get behind when, when I was younger. Um, but, you know, looking back at the way he led a team uh, on and off the field and also the way he played it, despite the fact that, you know, his physical um, presence wasn't quite what it could have been. 
Um, so he might've been another one from, from when I was younger. Um, uh, these days, I don't know if I love to hate anyone. You kind of appreciate all the players who've made it for their various reasons. Um, and if I hate a player, it's probably because I know them. But I thought it was hate to love, not love to it. Well, either way, it's the same thing, isn't it? Do you know what I mean? Like it's, it, it you know, um, it, 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 it's one of those things that it's, it's a, it's, a, it's it, what that is, is a writing device. <laughs> And why the Cricket Monthly came across it is because they realized that they could just contact a bunch of cricket writers around the world and everyone would have a player that they have a thing with. I don't think that many people were like, I love to hate them or I hate to love them. Or it, what they were saying, what it is, is it allows you to write with a complicated mindset. Does that make sense? So when you're writing about that player, you're going to be writing positives and negatives about them, which isn't the normal way that you usually write about a player in, in that sort of way. So... Uh, I don't know if it was Usman or um, Rahul or, or Sidvi or whoever came up with that idea, but it's a it's a old old school magazine uh, writing tactic um, that allows you to get a free column uh, once a month from a writer who's always going to have an opinion on a player. Yeah, Ole, thanks. No worries. Cheers. Thanks for your question, Nikhil. You there? Nikhil? Oh, wait. Probably got to actually press him. Sorry, Nikhil, are you there, mate? Looks like you've got mute on, Nikhil. There you Sorry. are. That's all right. Hey, mate, what's your question? All right. So I was just thinking about Tony Gregg and Richie Bano and a bunch of other past commentators. And one of the things Tony Gregg always said was only speak if you can add to what the viewer is watching. Now, Ian Chappell mm -hmm. says the same thing, uh, but especially Tony Gregg... That's because they were trained by the same people. Fair enough, fair enough. But my <laughs> other point is, I'm specifically talking of Tony Gregg or any of those past comments. Did they really do that? Uh, I think they just had a better voice or a better accent than a lot of commentators today. But my larger point is essentially TV commentary with the exception of, say, a Benno or a Chapel, you know, has always been stating the obvious. I mean, Tony Gray often stated the bleeding obvious. Uh, he often said, oh, wow, that's a great shot. Oh, it's running away to the boundary. He just said it in a way that was different and, uh, you know, more palatable. Michael Holding as well. Okay, I love the man. I would do anything for him. But he is not a particularly insightful cricket commentator, you know. Uh, what is it that is going to... And the less said about Indian Indian commentators on Star Sports, the better, because I literally watch every match on Star Sports on mute. So that's the problem, uh, with the exception of maybe Harshak, who's who again. I mean, his his overall level has come down by being with uh, you know Gavaskar or Murli Karthik or you know Siva or any of those guys. But he's the better of the lot. He's a great presenter. But just generally, like I mean, there's there's, there's almost no good commentators from Pakistan. There's Athar Ali Khan has become a meme from Bangladesh. Channel 9, uh, you've said it multiple times, it's more like it's not a TV channel and therefore the dog of pineapple pea. Sorry, can you hear me? Yeah, oh, so yeah. I'm yeah. just trying to say that yeah. when are we going to get the next great TV commentator and is the next generation going to find kinds of want you did at talk sport, you know, or you know, Norm, you know, Jonathan Norman at talk sport, a little more casual, a little more uh, sort of irreverent because people are, you know, people are getting fed up with the exception of Sky Sports, of course. People are getting fed up with TV comment. I mean, Shane Vaughan, God bless his soul, great cricketer, inspirational, but he was a terrible commentator. So, I mean, I'm just trying to think were the, were the commentators of the past really that different or did they just preach management? speak but actually never practice what they did with the exception of Benjamin Chappell. No, I think if you go back and watch uh some of Roe Belinda's old Channel 9 clips, you'll see there's a lot of silence. Uh I, I don't think that you need to be silent. Um so uh I think that <laughs> Richie Benno probably took it to an extreme uh where you you possibly you don't need to go that far. But I think that if you do listen back, there's a lot more silence on the old old 90s, uh, well, 80s and 90s broadcasts, especially in the test matches. So they're definitely, they definitely did do that. My problem with commentary, and, you know, every time I talk about it, I get, 
I get contacted by some TV producer who tells me all the problems that they have. But essentially what happens is you get a, uh, the TV company who's paid what $5 billion for the rights. They want famous people to commentate. Why? What they don't. Why do they want famous because, people? Because they're, they want stars to commentate on stars and they think that's what fans want. Here's the problem. I, I don't know how much you follow American sports, but American broadcasting for sports, they have a lot of stars. But those stars are expected to do a lot of work. Those stars are expected to watch quite a few games, to keep on top of things, to do research. Then before games, those broadcasters go in and have meetings with the teams. Usually the coach, sometimes, you know, uh, some of the star players, maybe the, the up and coming young player or the old veteran who's ch turned the corner, which means when they broadcast, they're broadcasting from a position of knowledge. They're also held accountable for how they commentate on air. As in, if you're too boring, if you're too unclear, if you're too cliche, all those things, because it's a proper production. That is not sadly how the majority of cricket is broadcast. I think there are too many producers who feel they can't speak to former players and the former players don't do the work. Uh, and those players are protected by a higher up. I think there's also a big problem that is worth mentioning that when you talk about, you know, there's no good commentators from India, Bangladesh, um, Pakistan, it's very hard for people whose English is not their native language. And, and by that, I mean that not native, actually, their automatic language, right? So if you grow up speaking... Gavaskar, I'm really sorry to interrupt you. Gavaskar is like very fluent in English. When you put him in a studio as a TV presenter... He... Very fluent, very fluent is not the same as automatic. What language does he dream in would be my question. I what know for a fact that he speaks to Rohan Gavaskar in English because I've, yeah. I've sort of seen him at a party. That, yeah, but that's different. That's different. What language does he dream in? What language does he think in? Mm -hmm. Right? If he doesn't dream and think in English, that's a problem. But Sonal Gavaskar's English skills are not the problem. Uh, Sonal Gavaskar has not developed as a commentator because he hasn't followed the game and because he doesn't do the work correctly. Occasionally, I, I've said this before on this very podcast, occasionally he says something that's so insightful and I'm just like, oh my God, this is what he should be doing. But unfortunately, he's not following the game in the same way. And he's doing what, what we talked about with one of those questions before, where um, he's going back on his old experiences rather than actually following the game consistently um, and growing with it in the way that, say, other commentators, uh, say, um, you know, someone like Nasu Hussain who tries to stay current with, with, with the modern game. So there's a lot of different problems. The other problem is, oh, sorry. Is a lack of feedback loop or an accountability an issue, especially in the subcontinent, because there is so much of a hero worship. Not especially in the subcontinent, everywhere, everywhere across cricket. There's, t there's a couple of reasons for this. One is that, so Ian Chappell told me straight out that Channel 9's commentary went when they stopped getting proper editorial control. When they would come off air after a bad stint and no one would tell them they'd done anything bad, that's when it got bad. So that feedback loop, if you don't have it, if you don't have people going, mate, we don't need to be doing that, right? Uh, John Norman at TalkSport, we, we, there was a particular session that we were really poor at. Um, I can't remember which game we were commentating and just sent a message going, what are you guys doing, right? This is not why people are, are tuning in to listen to this. Send us while we're on air, right? He didn't even wait for us to get off air. He's like, guys, this is not good enough. This is not what you should be doing. That is not the case in a lot of places. But here's the major problem, I think, with cricket commentary. And I've probably never written this and probably should. There aren't enough professional cricket commentators. So if you think about it, if you're Tony Romo in the NFL or um, Gary Lineker, right? Or Gary Lineker doesn't commentate, but whoever, whoever the former England players are who commentate, right? They spend six, seven, eight months of the year working on being a commentator, knowing that that's their job, planning for it and commentating, right? Let's say you're an IPL commentator. You've got two months of IPL commentary. So let's say you're Danny Morrison. You've got two months of IPL commentary. Then you don't get any work for a little while after that. Then randomly the CPL call you um, and you go and do a month there, right? And then, you, then you're doing a bunch of coaching in Queensland. Um, maybe you're doing some speaking engagements. 
maybe doing whatever else, right? He's not a professional commentator. He's a person who's finding all these different ways to survive and occasionally doing commentary, right? That is what cricket commentators are. Most of these guys, when they come in, and, and, and trust me, commentating is not, it's really hard. I, I had to do it yesterday. Last minute call up because a, a couple of people weren't available for talk sport. They call me in um on thursday i'll be you know when most people are listening to this i'll already be on sen commentating the new zealand england series having not commentated for a while you need that pattern you need that you, you need that little bit in and you also need to be able to have done the preparation i probably wasn't very good on talk sport yesterday because i didn't know i was going to be doing west indies netherlands until literally the night before the game I couldn't do all that research. So yesterday was probably a very poor day of commentary from me because of that. Luckily, it rained a lot, so I could just waffle on about normal stuff that I knew. But as far as the players go, you know, I had a pretty good idea of the West Indies players, but there was a lot of young Netherlands players that I wasn't even expecting to be playing. So I didn't know much about them, and I couldn't add as much as I would have liked to have added. So these people aren't working on it in the same way that football commentators are because a lot of these football commentators are contracted for long periods of time. So in American sports commentators. So we have this period where you basically have even the best commentators in the world or the most famous commentators in the world are part time. Right. And I think you can see a real difference with Simon Duell and Ian Bishop, two guys who have managed to be, do a lot more commentary than others. I didn't think Ian Bishop was particularly great when he started. He's really good now. I didn't think Simon Dool was particularly great when he started, and he's really good now. And if you go back and watch the Channel 9 footage from the early 80s, it's not very good commentary. It takes time to get good at this, and you need to know it is your job. Those Channel 9 guys knew that they had three months of the year where it was their job, and it became, it became sort of the center of their universe a little bit more. A lot of the IPL commentators don't even know if they're going back next year. Right? They don't have long-term contracts. They, aren't, they don't have job security. Um, then, you're, then you end up commentating with TalkSport or um, SABC or, you know, uh, one of the, you know, uh, what is it, Pitch and um, Sunset and Vine. You get contracts with them. The whole thing, it's not, it's not being pushed to make better commentators. It's literally being pushed to be like, who's the most famous voice this week? And to be a commentator. Yeah. So, sorry. Just yeah. one last thing. Sorry. Sorry, Daddy. No, go ahead. Is it? How much of it has got to do with the voice of... Now, David Lloyd, uh, Pumbel, uh, I actually really like him. But if I have to be critically honest, he's nowhere on the same level as uh, Athers or Bumble, uh, or Athers or, or Nasser or even Ricky Ponting. Because every time, every time, even on the podcast or the Sky Sport podcast, they would ask him a difficult question. He would just like, you know, joke about it or, you know, well, okay, Bumble, how was the pitch? Oh, there was no pitch. And that's it, you know, and that's not what I'm looking for as a listener or a viewer. So how much of it is down to, I mean, how how much of it is down to just having a great voice? And even though you, that you don't speak very well or insightful, you still are looked at as a great commentator, like David Lloyd is. I know he's I, a look, I, at talk sports, so it's my personal opinion. Uh, I, I don't think he works for us, does he? Um, I might have done a couple of days with him once. He's going to be signing a contract, I'm pretty sure. Because that's what uh, the news said. I mean, Daily Mail said, uh, uh, anyway. Possible. I, I don't know. If, um, I don't know much cricket talks about have up, but yeah, he might be. He almost, I think he almost joined us for a previous um, series. Uh, but he certainly, I have commentated with, with him before at Talksport and in other places. Uh, and I know Bumble a little bit. No, so Bumble's Bumble's a different kettle of altogether because Bumble is what is a casual cricket fan commentator. Bumble's appeal isn't to you and me, right? Bumble's appeal is generally to my mum. My mum absolutely loves Bumble. If I'm if I'm commentating, my mum doesn't care about short leg and you know she knows a fair bit about cricket. She was a cricket scorer and you know grew up in well you know uh, had me as a son and, and my old man as a husband. So she, you know she understands a lot about the game, but she doesn't really care about any of that sort of stuff. She will listen to Bumble all day long, um, and that's where Bumble's thing is. And you have to understand that we are, and you know, I did, I did a podcast with Harsha Bogle about this very topic. We are cricket people and we want cricket commentators. That's not necessarily what people should be pushing. Um, because you have to understand that there are a lot of casual fans listening. The problem is that I don't think the casual fans are being particularly well catered for either. Um, I, I don't think the level of commentary in any way is high. And I think it's, partly because of the way TV companies and occasionally radio um, organizations, although radio is so not important in cricket anymore, 
um, hire people. Um, but I also think it's this thing of very few people think of themselves as a commentator and plan and research and do the work. Listen to Ian Bishop, uh, Damien Fleming, uh, Simon Duell. Listen to what they're saying. Even same, uh, 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 Damien Fleming's telling jokes all the time. But he, you can also tell he's read everything that's on Crick Info. Um, he's probably gone out and done some other research and talked to some people to work some stuff out. Simon Duell does a lot of research. Uh, Ian Bishop is constantly quoting random, you know, sometimes he'll quote, quote something from Crick Info or Crick Buzz, but quite often he'll, he'll quote something from like uh, a blog or somewhere else. There's certainly a lot, they're doing a lot more research. I think those two people particularly... Murali Karthik, on the other hand, still thinks runners are allowed in international cricket. I mean, it baffles me. Yeah, and so I think there's a big difference between people who take the craft very seriously. I, I, I've told this story before, but, you know, I had a former international player commentating uh, with me at one stage, and he came off air. First time he'd done it, and he's like, that was easy. I could do this forever. And I was like, well, then you're not doing it right. It shouldn't be easy, right? Uh, if, if that's the case, you're just talking about stuff that you already know, right? Now, the, the trick is for you to be able to do this, also to learn how to communicate, right? I don't think commentators are taught how to communicate correctly. I don't think they're taught what the job means from a research standpoint. I don't think they're held, held accountable enough for what they do. But mostly, I think they're, it's because, oh, uh, I'm going to do this test. Then I'm going to have three weeks off. Then I'm going to do this. Uh, I'm actually coaching an academy this week. Then I've got a bunch of speaking engagements and I've got a, a sponsor th golf uh, tournament that I have to run. Oh, and then I have commentary on the end of that. And I think that too often that that is the case. There's too many parts of the system of cricket commentary that don't allow for us to have better commentators. And uh, yeah, as someone who's, you know, um, done consultancy work for, for broadcasters before, it's like, if you, if you, what they do, and I promise you this happens over and over again, they, they just keep going for the next player who's retired. They put them on air and, and then they, um, if they're good, they get more work. And if they're bad, they get uh, no work. And it's like, well, You've just thrown someone on air with no stuff. And they always say the same things. They always say, just be yourself, right? And I, I always do it in a different way. When, when I get commentators, I always say, you're here because you're you, right? But this is specifically why I have hired you. This is what I'm looking for from you, right? And I, and I really clearly state what I'm looking for from them. You know, you played here. You did this. You know about this. This is what you're passionate about. This is what you're good at communicating. This is what you want to do. This whole idea of like commentators is natural. It's like, I was with Dan Norcross when he started. He had a great voice. He's a 10 times better commentator now than when he started. Uh, Brett Lee is one of the best examples of this. Brett Lee is still a very average commentator. He was unlistenable to for five years. Right? If you, I think if Channel you, 9, I think Channel 9 didn't allow him to develop because he was surrounded by you know, Ian Healy or, you know, Shane Moore talking of pizzas or... Also, his, be his best friend was the reason he was on, you know, uh, you know, uh, w was on that commentary. And I don't think his best friend was... It, it gave him the job, but I don't think they helped him develop. I think he's got a lot better over the last couple of years as he's developed outside of that Channel 9 thing for many different reasons. Um, but, but essentially, Brett Lee got better at it. Most people get better at it over a period of time, except for the ones who still say the same thing over and over again. Um, and look, Ian Chappell, you talked about him as a very good commentator. He, you know, he has about five stories that he rehashes all the time. Um, but again, you know, should be, that, sh that should be trained out of him, right? Come up with more stories, talk to more people, get more, more, more interest. So I certainly think that th all those things are a problem, but the fact that we have seen commentators get better over time, I think suggests to me that there is a way to do it. And I think at the moment, this idea of former player is, uh, is, is currently famous or hot or, um, and so we'll get them on, uh, they, they're, they're good, but they weren't that good. So we won't get them back next year. Oh, but now they they've just, you know, released a podcast or they're, they're really, you know, popular on social media. So we'll get them back again. It doesn't work. When you get a commentator, you have to train them up to be, this is what the, the job is. This is what the work is. Um, and the best commentators I've worked with, as far as former players go, do a lot of research. And that's the difference, being able to do a lot of research. There are some people who are very good at blagging because they do have a good voice, as you said, and also because they're very good at talking. You know, cr cricket commentary, whether it be TV or radio, is essentially a conversation. People who are very good at conversation end up being 
very listenable to, even if they're not always giving us the insights that you and I might like. Uh, and I think that in this particular case, uh, that is something that you can help commentators with. And I think that the easy thing to do is to pile onto the commentators and we've all done it and I've done it a hundred times. The more important thing to do is to look at why this happens and it's not the commentator's fault. It's quite literally, it's not even the producer's fault in some places, although sometimes it is the producer's fault, but quite often it's the, it's the fact that these people don't have it as a main job and they're not taking it as, they're not thinking about it as a main job. Um, and if you think that you can get by just by being your name, you will get by by being your name. If you start to be held to account, things change. Thanks, Jared. My dream, no by, the way, by the way, still is you and Andy Zaltzman with Gideon Haig uh, <laughs> sort of floating in and out. Thanks, thanks so uh, much. I, I tell you what, one day me and Andy will definitely do commentary together. I promise that. Um, but thank you very much for your question. We just got a couple in the text, which I'll just get through. Um, uh, have you ever done a deep analytical dive on Rajat Bhatia's career? I haven't. Um, he's one of those guys that uh, him, who's the other one, the West Indian, Kevon Cooper. Uh, as you mentioned here, I've done Benny Howe, but I did Benny Howe in the middle of his career. Because I think Kevon Cooper and uh, Rajat Bhatia sort of finished before I started covering th those sorts of topics. Um, but Rajat Bhatia's numbers always stick out to me. There's no way I'm never not going to do it just because I think he's a really interesting cricketer. And Kevon Cooper is the other one that I would really like to do. Drew says, how can people in associate nations create a career in cricket? Well, it depends on what kind of career that you're doing. But basically, I, I, I think that there's huge, um, I think there's huge opportunities in associate cricket because quite often there are fewer people going for those jobs. Uh, and there's also the ability to make media, uh, if, if it's a media position, there's uh, the ability to make media, uh, or, you know, if you look at someone like Andrew Leonard in Ireland or Peter De La Pena in the USA or Bertus de Jong in, in Netherlands, if you become an expert, you become the go-to person and then you can build a career on the back of that. Um, and if you're talking about working with teams, again, you know, the more that you can offer a team, uh, especially an amateur team, the more likely you are to build a career going forward. Um, and you end up being maybe the Mr. Fix-It person and maybe you end up, end up being the team manager or something bizarre like that or the social media manager or whatever that may be. Um, but I think there are a lot of opportunities in associate cricket because I think it's growing so fast, but, uh, and that means the industry around it is growing so fast as well. Siddharth says, most talented cricketer to not succeed in international cricket. Uh, I suppose Graham Hicks, a fairly good example of that. Uh, Ian Bishop, I suppose, did succeed. Um, Brett Schultz uh, is probably another, I mean, there's heaps of fast bowlers. Uh, so if you're talking injury wise, um, there's a lot of fast bowlers that are like that. Um, Chuck Fleetwood Smith, uh, because of the war, probably we missed his best years. Um, there's probably a few other cricketers around the world that we, a, a bunch of New Zealand cricketers. Uh, Martin Donnelly is one, I think there's about five or six New Zealand cricketers. No, maybe three or four New Zealand cricketers we missed because of the war. Um, and there was also a couple of early New Zealand cricketers who were absolutely incredible, who went off to play cricket professionally in England. Um, so we didn't get the most out of them. Uh, I suppose, I mean, Andre Russell, if you're talking international cricket, did we ever get the most out of Andre Russell as an international cricketer? Still think that, you know, batting, bowling, batting at number eight um, and bowling 90 miles an hour when he was young and fit would have been a hell of a cricketer. Um, <laughs> phenomenal cricketer, really. Uh, so I, I suppose we missed out on him. So, yeah, there's, there's tons. Um, you know, Vinod Cambly comes to mind as another cricketer that I don't think uh, people got the most out of. There's a lot of cricketers in, uh, you know, someone like Matthew Elliott and Martin Love, um, perhaps Stuart Law, those sorts of levels of cricketers that were absolutely top level cricketers who just didn't play enough um, uh, because the team was so strong. Probably, I'm trying to think if there's a, probably a bunch of Australian middle order batters I'm missing as well. I said Law is a perfect example of that, but quite a few others as well. And, and if you look at it, I mean, uh, Roddy Eswick, who's the current West Indian assistant coach and bowling coach, I think, he has a bowling average for Barbados of like 21 or something like that. There's a whole generation of West Indian cricketers who were just incredible. Richard Austin um, couldn't get in the team. <laughs> it's the team was so strong. Uh, so there's a bunch for you, mate. Um, and Keshav says, last week you talked about uh, Simon's Ponte Mark Wars fielders. That got me thinking... Can we have the best fielders ranking in cricket in future based on catches taken, drop, runouts, 
hit missed run saved yeah i so we would never do it on those metrics and those metrics are a bit reductionist uh the best way to be able to do it is to have a special tr uh, especially for outfielders no actually you can do it for everyone yeah you can do it for everyone is to have some kind of a spatial tracking camera that is recording um the physical movement so think about it this way an edge comes and the ball goes uh towards masali raj's hat over here right one player dives and drops it another player doesn't drive at all dive at all and we don't count it as a chance the third player moves their feet across a couple of steps and take it as a catch all right we we know that you know the edge that goes what a meter and a half to your right let's say at pace we know that we have probably that happen in international cricket let's say a thousand times a year right probably not that many but however many if we get to the point where we can spatially track that we can tell you if we have a let's say it is caught 67 percent of the time uh that's probably a bit high 58 percent of the time um we will then be able to tell you if there are players who are regularly catching above the average or stopping the ball above the average and below the average spatial tracking can tell us all of that and at the moment uh, we're held back by the fact that we play cricket on so many different grounds and that no cricket board that I'm aware of has um, invested in this. I talked to the Big Bash about this in 2017. They were mad keen to do it, uh, which I think was their phrase, um, and they still haven't done it. And so uh, that's the best way to be able to tell who the best fielders are in the world. Uh, it's a really simple one. We'd be able to tell who the best runners between wickets are. Also, we'd learn a lot more about field placements. It would be absolutely brilliant. But honestly, I don't see it happening within the next five years of cricket. Anyway, thank you to everyone. Uh, for coming on board, um, listening to this live or listening to this on the podcast or watching me on the YouTube. Thanks to Bodyline T-shirts for my T-shirt. Um, and uh, thank you for all of your support. Uh, sorry, it was uh, we moved it a little bit earlier this week, but that's because uh, when the test matches are on, I need to move the podcast around a little bit. But uh, uh, it will still come out on the normal day if you tuned in a little bit late and you want to follow up. But thank you so much for everyone for coming in the Spotify green room and for everyone listening. Remember, share, like, subscribe the bells all those sorts of things that people tell you at the end of these kinds of videos and podcasts talk to you next time